Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to today's CSIS session, COVID-19 Variants Rattle the World. I'm Jay Stephen Morrison, Senior Vice President and Director of the CSIS Global Health Policy Center. This session sponsored by the CSIS Commission on Strengthening America's Health Security, which was founded 2018. That work is carrying forward through the end of 2022. We're delighted that one of our commissioners, Peggy Hamburg, the former FDA commissioner, during the Obama administration will be presiding today. I wanna to offer special thanks to my colleague, Amit Mandavili for his careful efforts to put all of these pieces together very rapidly for today. And, and to Anna uh, McCaffrey, my colleague um, who also contributed substantially. And a special thanks to all who are assembled here today to speak, Rochelle Walensky, Maria Van Kerkhove, Lois Pace, Oliver Morgan, John Brooks. They'll be introduced momentarily by Peggy Hamburg. Today's event grew out of a CSIS commentary that my colleague Anna McCaffrey and I published January 22nd, New Variants Rattle the World. We scrambled to put this session together rapidly for a few reasons. We're at a major moment, a turning point. The variants are threatening to change the pandemic, including the feasibility and development of vaccines and therapies. And there's a lot of fast moving questions around what this all means. There are all three about what it'll take to achieve herd immunity, how high the bar will have to be. And they're adding new urgency in how in controlling the spread, in accelerating vaccination programs, in creating genomic sequencing capacity and R&D of adaptive vaccines and therapies and in integrating efforts globally. We'll hear about all of these topics today. We're also at a major moment when President Biden is renewing the US relationship with the World Health Organization, something that all of us have advocated and we're delighted to see happening. We wanna to use today in part to celebrate that and show what it means. The US WHO relationship and the many collaborations remind, remain vitally important across many fronts. Uh, and we'll hear about that today. We'll hear about the evolving uh, collaborations. This is the first of a series of high level sessions where we will attempt to bring to the table the perspectives of both the Biden administration and senior levels at WHO on very important and urgent matters, along with other experts. So uh, we're delighted that from WHO, we have Maria Van Kerkhoff, an American citizen, and we have Oliver Morgan, who served at CDC for 10 years. Over to you, Peggy. Thank you so much for presiding with us, and thank you for all your contributions to the CSIS Commission. Well, thank you very much. I couldn't be happier to be with all of you, although I wish that it wasn't about a topic that is as uh, worrisome and as urgent. But as Steve just said, you know, I think that the emergence of these variants really requires us to rethink and renew our commitment to how we invest in public health, the importance of science driving our actions, the importance of international collaboration, and the importance of coming together across these different components to focus in and talk about problems that need meaningful solutions. And so we hope that today's discussion will really be a contribution to deepening understanding of these challenges before us and what needs to be done. And for many of us, it's also our first introduction to our new CDC director, Rochelle Walensky. And so we're really so pleased that with everything else on her plate, day 11, I think, into her tenure that she has chosen uh, to be with us, but she only has 30 minutes. So I'm not gonna say anything further on um, framing uh, the issue, but we'll just uh, quickly uh, introduce our panelists and then get into the substance. You know, as I said, we have Rochelle Walensky, the Biden administration's new CDC uh, director with us. She's the 19th director 
of the um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the ninth administrator of the uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry as well. She is well known in the infectious disease community and the public health community nationally and internationally, predominantly from her work on HIV AIDS, but also the leadership and wisdom that she has provided uh, throughout the COVID crisis. Um, after she leaves, then her, her colleague, uh, John Brooks, will still be available um, to stay with us and, and help be a voice for CDC programs and policies um, in our ongoing discussion. We also, as has been noted, um, have Maria von Kerkhoff, uh, the COVID-19 technical lead of the WHO Health Emergencies Program. And she's joining us uh, from Geneva along with her colleague, Oliver Morgan. And um, she has really devoted her life and career to uh, global public health. Uh, she has worked in several different roles with WHO over the years and also has worked um, at the Imperial College. Um, she is a U.S. citizen. I don't know that you're spending enough time here working in the U.S. or with U.S. institutions, but we'll welcome you back at any time. But she is just a, a, a distinguished and accomplished um, epidemiologist and public health specialist um, who I know will help us uh, shed some light on the issues of the day. And then finally, Lois Pace, who's the executive director of the Global Health Council. And um, she has also been a longstanding leader in global public health and has uh, devoted her career uh, to working not just on programs and policies, but also on the ground in, in 10 countries or more, uh, leading health programs and mobilizing advocates before joining the Global Health Council as president and executive director. Uh, she had important leadership positions in global policy and strategic partnerships at Live Strong Foundation and at the American Cancer Society. So she brings a breadth and depth of perspective and experience to these issues. So let me turn now, we're going to um, first hear from Rochelle um, and, and we'll have a little bit of an exchange after her presentation. Then after she leaves, we'll have brief presentations from our other two major panelists and then time for uh, questions and answers and more discussion before our hour ends. So with all of that introduction, let me turn to you, Rochelle, with first with a big welcome and the, uh, the podium, so to speak, <laughs> is yours. The two-dimensional podium. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm really just quite honored to be with you today. Thank you for that lovely in introduction and the invitation to be here. COVID-19 has brought to the forefront how interconnected we are as a global community and the importance of our international scientific collaborative relationships. Thanks to you, Steve, and to the Center for Strategic and International Studies for convening us here today and for this really important dialogue. The emergence of variants is, of course, concerning and underscores really the essential need for real-time surveillance and increased vigilance in the implementation of public health mitigation measures. So today's meeting um, focus is both timely and critical. We know that viruses mutate, and variants that emerge as dominant often do so to some advantage to the virus itself. The higher amount of virus in the community, the more opportunity there is for viral replication and for variants to develop. In the United States, 467 cases of B117 variant lineage that originated from the UK have been confirmed in 32 states as of yesterday. In addition, one case of the P1 variant originally detected in Brazil has been identified in the United States and Minnesota. And three cases of the B1351 variant first detected in South Africa have con been confirmed in the United States, two in separate cities in South Carolina, and one case in Maryland that was reported this weekend. The available data on these variants suggests that they are more transmissible and may lead to more cases, taxing our already overwhelmed healthcare system, and pressing questions remain about the imp impact of these variants that will, they will have on vaccine effectiveness, severity of disease, and mortality. 
CDC has been acting on multiple fronts to increase the surveillance in the United States for variants of SARS-CoV-2. Since November, state health departments and other public health agencies have been regularly sending samples to CDC for sequencing and further analysis. This system is called NS3, or the National SARS-CoV-2 Strain Surveillance, and is now being scaled to process 750 samples per week and will be increasing to 15 samples per week in the coming weeks, geographic geographically distributed across all states. We have also contracted with large national commercial reference labs to look for variants and expect that these labs will be able to analyze about 3,000 samples per week now and 6,000 samples per week by the middle of February. As a result of these efforts, our throughput of samples has increased tenfold in the recent weeks, going from 251 sequences in the week of January 10th to 2,238 sequences during the week of January 24th. And this may well be among the reasons that we're finding more variants now. Additionally, CDC has contracts with seven universities that are working with public health agencies to identify variants. We've released $15 million to several health departments in the United States to accelerate the integration of next generation sequencing and bioinformatics into the United States public health system. And we're leading a coalition of over 200 cross-sector organizations to set standards and share information about SARS-CoV-2 sequence-based surveillance. In addition to these efforts, the CDC is conducting research to assess growth and replication properties of these variants in vitro to establish their fitness and conduct antibody neutralization testing of variant strains to identify potential vaccine escape phenotypes and to help prioritize new mutations of concern. CDC is also engaged with the NIH's Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines, or ACTIVE, public-private partnership that aims to facilitate the rapid development of the most promising treatment and vaccines. These efforts are fast moving and variants continue to spread throughout the globe, globe uh, throughout the globe. Hopefully our efforts are moving faster than the variants. This reality underscores our international the need for our international collaboration and our regular information sharing. And that is why the CDC is so heartened. I am personally heartened by the recent efforts of the administration to renew our long history of partnership with the World Health Organization. WHO has been a critical partner and connector of public health, in particular in responding to public health emergencies like that which we are in today. As you know well, the COVID-19 pandemic is the public health challenge of our lifetime. And the rapid emergence of readily transmissible variants across the globe underscores the critical need for strong scientific partnerships internationally. The CDC is committed to that partnership. I am personally committed to that partnership. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Um, you certainly are joining CDC at uh, one of the most extraordinary moments in time. and. Uh, with so many urgent challenges before you, um, you know, to, to begin to understand how to set priorities. But this one has been delivered in your lap, but it is a very, very fundamental public health challenge. And it, it's a reminder, I think, about, you know, the, the critical importance of public health and surveillance and applying all of the best tools of science and technology uh, to surveillance. And as you were describing the efforts that are gearing up to do genomic surveillance, you know, I of course was reflecting on the fact that it's ironic that the US, which has led in the area of, of genomics, you know, for, for now, you know, several decades, that we should have lagged so far behind in terms of applying that knowledge and capacity to the, the unfolding uh, COVID pandemic. Um, but what's also striking to me is that as we build this urgent capacity now to respond to the situation that we're in, are we doing it in a way that is creating uh, an integrated surveillance system, both nationally at the you know, local state and, and um, federal level, 
and internationally, but, but a system that can, can remain in place also, because this kind of um, surveillance needs to be applied to many other challenges, both routine and of course, we all recognize that this um, may hopefully be the worst pandemic of our lifetimes, but these kinds of infectious disease threats will continue to occur. I, I think you raise um, a fundamental point that I've been thinking about um, in, in our response from a public health standpoint. So first, we have to get out of this pandemic. That's got to be the first 10 things that I do as part of my job. Um, however, if we get out of this pandemic and we don't um, set the table for future generations in some several key areas that we missed coming into this pandemic, we will not have done anyone a service. So we have to rebuild the public health infrastructure because it was frail to start. It was never able to, um, to take on small outbreaks, never mind really large pandemics. We need to rebuild that. We need to rebuild the data system so that when we have, um, when the data are starting to emerge, we can actually recognize the, the um, new trends. We could have seen this coming. Um, I often will look back at our own state and see that there was influenza-like illness happening in, um, in February and March before we had tests, and yet influenza them itself was coming down. Is this something that we should have detected if we had seen better uh, case detection, better, better surveillance? And then, of course, the surveillance system that you are talking about. So um, the, the final piece of that, I will say, is the health equity piece. Um, if we are focusing on that now, if we're focusing on it in COVID, and we're, we're discussing that through COVID, if we only um, let it go there, we will have done a complete disservice. We need to make sure that the focus on that here is, is going to be throughout. So the, the big, and the, the overall response is we have to make sure we can get to enough surveillance right now, um, but that itself is not enough. We need to make sure that we're building the infrastructure and the systems so that they are in place for not just COVID, but for all the infectious threats that, that come after it and that are here now. Yes. Well, as we sort of learn more about these variants and where they are and how they're moving and the impact obviously that they're having on spread of disease and also the ability of um, new therapeutics and importantly vaccines uh, to protect against this SARS coronavirus too. Um, I just wanted to sort of um, dig a little bit deeper into to where we are. You know, you were talking about how the, the UK strain um, clearly is um, uh, causing enhanced transmission and, and spread. There has been um, some confusion, I think, in, in, in the coverage of this about whether it's actually more lethal. And of course, more studies need to be done, but is it that the virus itself is more lethal or that it's overwhelming the healthcare system. And so the quality of care and the ability to, to manage patients has declined. Is there more evidence on that? I noticed you did not say that it was more lethal, but I have heard others say that. So when we think about these variants, I think we worry about things in sort of four buckets. One is, is it more transmissible as you suggest? Is it more lethal? does it affect our treatments and does it affect our vaccines? So um, I, there are increasing data that suggest that it is somewhere between 50 and 70% more transmissible. That has a lot of implications um, for, our, um, for what is needed for herd immunity and things like that. Um, so I think the data are relatively strong or, and increasing that it's more transmissible. And from what the, the virology experts will tell me, um, that's probably the worst one actually, because if you have more transmission, then everything downstream from that actually increases as well. However, um, we also have now four relatively small studies out of the UK that have suggested also that not only it is, is it more lethal, but it may, and more transmissible, but it may in fact be also more lethal. I do think we need more data in this area. Um, the increased rates of um, mortality have been anywhere between 30 and 90%, but again, small studies. And so um, I think we have more information that we're going to need and we'll see more there. Um, 
the, the, in terms of vaccines, uh, data are starting to emerge right now. The, the press release from J&J &J suggested that um, there was uh, perhaps a small hit to vaccine efficacy in the B117 strain compared to the, um, to the native strain. Um, but that overall, I think the vaccine efficacy data from J and J were really quite good, especially when you look at the um, rates of severe and uh, and deadly disease hospitalizations, um, which were really um, pretty well averted by the vaccine to the efficacy of eighty five percent. So I think overall we still have a lot more that we need to learn. Um, there are data in the lab, in vivo data, that suggests that um, from pseudoviruses that suggests that our current Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are actually working, have the potential of working pretty well against the B117 strain. And, and I think we're, we have a lot more to learn. Yeah. Well, I guess that in terms of the ability to evade the immune system, there's more to worry about when we look at, at the variants that have, have emerged in um, uh, South Africa and Brazil, and it looks like there the, the vaccine efficacy may not be quite as strong, but still, you know, adequate to prevent serious disease and death and, um, and certainly a considerable protection. But um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the role of um, the CDC in partnership with the other public health agencies is in terms of making sure that the right studies are getting done both by the companies and in other settings to really better understand um, what, what the impact of, of new variants may be on the vaccine efficacy, as well as maybe touch on what the thinking is. I mean, we've heard that there may be investments in developing new uh, vaccines for potential boosts over time. And of course the mRNA technology for vaccines in particular lends itself to being able to quickly um, you know, develop using that platform a new vaccine. So maybe a little bit about the impact of these new variants on the research and development agenda. Yeah, that's, it's a key point. I think there are, there are numerous spaces that I think we need to think about. Um, one is this active collaboration that we're in collaboration with, with BARDA, DOD, NIH, as well as the CDC, so that when these variants emerge, when we actually have access to them, we can do um, we can do st science in the lab to look at whether um, whether neutralizing antibody from either convalesced patients or from vaccinated patients is actually um, effective against these variants. Um, and there's a lot of uh, cross scientific collaboration and sharing there. Um, I think we need to really start thinking about. Um, how we're going to do population-based vaccine efficacy studies in the context of variants. Um, what will the cohorts look like? How will we know? And, and our team is working um, actively on that right now to sort of set up cohorts um, that's not just through passive surveillance of this person had gotten a vaccine and therefore, and now they're infected, now we need to look. So I think there are a lot of um, studies underway in the science, in the, in the basic lab, but then also at the population level to say, how are we going to collect the data on the vaccine failures? Um, that's not as easy as it otherwise might seem. We don't want to be passive about it. And then finally, I think um, we want to be ahead of this. Um, we have the great gift that these mRNA vaccines can be tweaked. Um, and so the fact that they can be means we should be starting to do that now. There's a lot of vaccine that's been purchased already, but I've been told in, in not my words that we're not, we didn't buy the Chevy, we bought the Cadillac and whatever is the best vaccine for whenever it is available, that's the one that we'll be getting. So um, it may be that we have a two vaccine and then a booster require, uh, suggested. It may be that we have bivalent or trivalent vaccines. Um, it's not exactly clear where our steady state will be and what will be the vaccine to, to knock out whatever is left in the steady state, but we're, we're working to try and get ahead of any of those potential. Great, thank you. There is a question from the audience. I just wanna ask you quickly, and then I wanna see if Maria and Lois want to respond a little bit to what you've been saying before. I know you have to leave, but the question from the audience is what's the best way to communicate information about variants in the public without undermining trust in vaccination efforts? And I guess along with that is the challenge of, of communicating at this 
um, uh, critical time about the importance of the continued non-pharmaceutical interventions, the mass, the social distancing, avoiding um, you know, large congregate settings, et cetera. Um, you know, I, this, you're, you're tapping on a really key point. You know, people are saying, well, what are we gonna do about the variants? And the truth is it's the same disease, right? We're gonna do the same thing for the variants that we've been doing all along. The problem is that not everybody's doing it. I just looked at some data um, out of our two South Carolina variants. Um, you know, there were at least 15 contacts of people among of both those variants and masks were not worn at all. Hmm. So um, it's really, uh, or at least to my knowledge, um, but, but limited mask wearing is my understanding in those contexts. So it is probably the case that um, everything that we should be doing for the disease, we should also be doing for the variants. We are going to have a lot of communication challenges as we start seeing the um, data from these trials that are going to suggest that one vaccine against one variant may have less efficacy than another. Um, but I think we have to be communicate often. We have to communicate in plain English. We need to be really transparent about what the data show. And quite honestly, the outcome here that we're trying to avoid is death and hospitalization and the vaccinations that we're, the vaccines that we're seeing work against those endpoints. And so we really, I think we, the messaging has to be consistent and clear. We also need to convey that we're doing the science actively and um, we have to be humble in what we're gonna learn. Well, thank you. And we're fortunate that you have real communication skills. So it's a very hard job. Uh, Maria, do you wanna just weigh in a little bit before we lose Rochelle? Well, thanks very much, Peggy and Rochelle. You, you've made my job easy in, in, in outlining all of these major issues. I mean, I think, I think what you've outlined is the different aspects of trying to understand these variants of concern in real time. We are seeing science happen in real time. We are seeing collaboration. We are seeing innovation. We are seeing data sharing. Um, and I think it's, it's foreshadowing what we are going to have to do into this, this year. You know, the virus is under pressure. This is what viruses do. This is part of the evolution of, of these viruses. And we're in a situation now where we're having events within events. And I think that what we are seeing is that we want the world to understand that there's a process in place to evaluate each of these mutations, um, each of these variants in terms of transmission, in terms of severity, in terms of potential impact on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Right now, as you've pointed out, we're in a situation where diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines work, but we may be in a situation where that changes. We need to be on this, where we have good eyes and ears around the world. And how you describe the situation in the US, we're trying to do on a global scale so that we can have that level of surveillance and eyes and ears in every country. And that's a pretty tall order right now in, in, a, in, a, in a challenging situation to start. But the last point on communication, I couldn't agree more open, honest, regular, humble. Um, you know, we won't always get it right, uh, but we have to, to tell the world that we are in this together and, and trying to understand this together. So just to reemphasize just some of those points, um, I think is really, really critical. And we're with you on this. You know, I think all scientists together are fighting the same virus, variants or not. And we are in this no matter what. So our goal is to suppress transmission, save lives, and end this pandemic. And, and we will definitely do that together. Great. And before Rochelle leaves, Lois, do you wanna just respond a little bit to her opening remarks? Of course, thanks Peggy and Rochelle. We're all glad to see you in this role and to have you here today. I mean, like Maria said, you made our jobs easy. Um, I really appreciated the audience members question about communication as well, because I sit and think about how we stay ahead of this, not just from a scientific standpoint, but from a messaging standpoint. And I do think you're the right person um, for that job. I would also add that it's not just up to scientists like um, the folks at CDC or WHO to communicate this either. We as advocates have a role in this. I think business leaders, I think other um, leaders around our country and around the world can each step up um, and help people understand where we are in this um, and, and understand as Maria said, how this is going to continue to evolve. And we're just as tired as everyone else. I don't know if everyone realizes that, how hard it is for those of us on, the, on a different type of front line. Um, it, it has been to keep up with this and to keep people's trust and faith in the science. Um, but, but we are seeing this real time um, evolve and we are doing our best to stay ahead of it. I think we can continue to do so, remembering all that we've done where we were last year when we knew nothing 
Um, I think we have to also recognize that we have come a long way and it's, we've made a lot of good progress. Um, and so we are with you, as Maria said, um, Rochelle, in, in the work that you do. And again, just happy to be joining you all today. Thanks, Peggy. Well, thank you. And, and Rochelle, I know that you do need to go. You know, we really do thank you for your time. Um, and I think that you can see the kind of support that you have, the eagerness of us all uh, to come together across disciplines, across sectors, and across borders in order to be able to, to you know, fight this virus together and um, to help us all move, all nations and all people to a, a better place. So d never hesitate to call on us. And um, I know you've got other, other tasks before you for today. <laughs> so you'll be ably represented, I know, by your, your colleague. Um, but, um, but thank you for spending the time and helping to introduce this topic for today's session. Thank you so much for having me for the partnership, the great work that you all are doing. Um, as I said, this ship is gonna rise because we're doing this together. Thank you very, very much. Terrific. Take care of yourself. <laughs> I will. You too. You all too. All right. Terrific. Thanks so much. We'll say goodbye to Rochelle, but I'll turn to you, Maria, next to maybe just enlighten us a little bit about um, the work that WHO is doing, um, the, the new activities that you're engaged in as we learn more about these variants and respond to them, and also your perspective on the re-engagement of the U.S. Um, uh, government with all of, of um, its resources and expertise back into the WHO family and, um, and what some of the priorities you see in terms of next steps in, in that important collaboration. Well, Peggy, thanks so much uh, again for the opportunity to be on this panel. And, and uh, Rochelle definitely uh, gave me an easy way in by describing all of the different situations with the, with the variants of concern around the world. I mean, I think one of the things we start with is sort of where we are in this pandemic. We're in a situation now where we have more than 100 million cases that have been reported worldwide. And that's an underestimate of the true level of infections that, we'd like, that are likely to have occurred so far. Um, but the virus and, and the spread is not the same around the world. Um, you know, it's really the intensity is quite different in different countries. More than half of the cases are really um, restricted within five major countries right now. But what we see globally, and if you look regionally, um, there are differences. There's heterogeneity within that. Um, and we see countries around the world that have controlled COVID with public health and social measures without the vaccine. Now the vaccine coming online is an incredibly powerful additional tool that will help us, um, but we cannot forget about the public health and social measures that exist already that need to empower individuals, families, and communities to, to really prevent as many infections as we can. So on the one hand, we are seeing countries that have controlled COVID whose societies are opening up and we have the extreme opposite end of that where we have some countries which are seeing a surge after surge. But the good news is that this virus and the variants that are being identified can be controlled. So you heard about the B117. So this is the variant of concern that originated that was that was identified first in the United Kingdom. I have uh, data in front of me from, from Oliver's team, in fact, updated as of a couple of hours ago, um, identified in 82 countries. We also have the, the, the variant that was first identified in South Africa, um, which is the B1351 or the 501YV2. I should stop myself because we're working on the nomenclature. It's too confusing with these variant names. Um, I am on record multiple times of saying we need to fix this because it's too hard to communicate all of these numbers. But the variant that was identified in South Africa um, has been identified in, in 39 countries. And the variant, the P1, that has, was first identified in Brazil has been identified in nine countries. So these viruses are spreading, but as we've said before, this is what happens with viruses. This is the natural evolution of viruses to mutate and to change. What we are trying to make sure that we have is a system in place to identify these mutations, to identify and study variants of interest and variants of concern. And so what WHO is doing is working to establish a risk monitoring framework globally 
which encapsulates several different aspects um, to be able to monitor. The first is surveillance. It starts with good epidemiologic surveillance, good molecular testing, the use of antigen-based tests, and in addition to that, genomic surveillance. So genomic surveillance worldwide is limited. Um, there are um, some good areas of the world where capacity is very strong, and there are some other areas of the world where it's quite weak. But what we're doing is we're leveraging existing systems. So we have a SARS-CoV-2 network that's global. We also have a flu network, flu network, the GISRIS network, which we will leverage even further to be able to test and sequence for uh, SARS-CoV-2. We're looking at leveraging HIV and TB and polio systems. And we're also looking within countries at academic labs, um, at commercial labs, at private labs that can do sequencing because we want capacities in country. But we can't just go, we can't just stop at the sequences. We have to make sure that we have uh, systems in place to share those sequences with metadata, with epidemiologic data, so that we can carry out what is called phylogenetic analyses and more detailed work to understand what these sequences mean. In addition, once we identify these mutations and these variants of interest, we have what we uh, have established in June is a virus evolution working group, which is looking at the suite of studies in vitro and in vivo studies working with collaborative labs around the world um, to understand differences in the viruses, the virus variants in terms of transmission, severity, um, and potential impact on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. We are linking through our R&D blueprint for epidemics uh, with animal model working groups and a large numbers of labs around the world and manufacturers to ensure that manufacturers and labs have access to these viruses. Um, and we are establishing a biohub. This was announced by our director general a few months ago around making sure that we have um, a lab and this will eventually be labs around the world that can receive these samples, grow the samples under bio, uh, the right conditions and share those samples with others so that many people have access to these variants. So this is a framework that covers everything from surveillance all the way to the other end of looking at vaccine composition because if these viruses change enough where they actually have an impact on the vaccines, and to date we haven't seen any of these variants that render the, the vaccines that we have available um, to, to not work, and that's very, very good news. We may be in a situation in the future, so we need to prepare for that. And ultimately, we want to be proactive instead of reactive. And so we're looking at mutations and combinations of mutations um, so that we can think ahead about those combinations of mutations and look at different variants to think about what that would mean for vaccine composition. But I think what is really, really critical is that while we are understanding these viruses, it's still SARS-CoV-2. It is still a highly transmissible and a deadly virus. And we still right now have measures in place that can prevent infections and can save lives. We have to emphasize this because it's scary. Um, it's people are fatigued. That's the other major global challenge we have right now is fatigue. People are tired. They want this to be over. I do too, and I know you do as well, but this virus is not sick of us. And so we really need to do everything that we can. And it's important that as scientists, um, as communicators, that we enable, uh, engage, enable, and empower everyone on the planet to understand what they can do. Every single person on this planet right now has some power, needs to know what they need to do to, to be in this fight with us. Um, and then just lastly, on the US um, WHO collaborations, um, that never changed. Um, you know, I'm looking at John smile at me at the bottom here. And, you know, we have had, I'm an American myself. Um, and, and we, the relationship between WHO uh, in the United States has been strong for decades. It has been strong throughout this pandemic. Um, we have had scientists working with us on all of our technical networks. We've had US CDC folk embedded within us from day one. Um, it's always been collaborative, constructive. We challenge each other, we push each other, um, but it's always been really wonderful. And it's gone from strength to strength and it will continue to go from strength to strength. So we are thrilled um, you know, w, uh, of, of you staying in the family, but quite frankly, you never left. Um, and we're really, really happy to continue that relationship because there are no borders uh, in this world right now. And viruses don't care what nationalities we are or where we live. 
So we have to put our scientific minds, our compassionate minds together um, and make sure that we are consistent in the approach and we give everybody the tools that they need uh, to end this pandemic. So thank you again for, for allowing us to be on this panel with you and inviting us to be on this panel. Um, and we have a long way to go and that partnership will help see us through. Well, thank you for a very rich overview of all that WHO is doing, or not all, some of what WHO is doing, but, um, but it's a lot. And one way where the US you know, re-engagement now hopefully can make a very significant difference is the US really helping to support the global vaccination um, effort, both by investing in um, the COVAX Act Accelerator um, uh, program, but um, you know, in, in other important ways as well, I would imagine. And you, know, you just made a very powerful case how um, the variants only um, underscore the need to um, really communicate clearly and advance the issues around the public health measures that can limit spread and reduce disease. Accelerating our vaccination efforts can make a difference too. And the recent reports have been very worrisome about the limits in supply and, and capacity for really achieving targets for vaccination in so many countries around the world. I wonder if you might just say a little bit more about um, uh, that set of, of issues um, as we think about <laughs> the many challenges before us. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that is really quite astounding is the fact that we have multiple vaccines that are safe and effective against COVID-19, against disease. Um, and there are more in the pipeline. So we need to encourage more development and uh, the phase two, phase three, three trials of the other vaccines that are in development as well, because the more vaccines we have, the more um, people that can be vaccinated uh, and more production that can be increased, um, more supplies in many different countries. And so there's a lot of work that's ongoing with that. And I should say that the work on the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine actually began before we even knew about SARS-CoV-2. And that began based on years of collaboration, including collaborations with US scientists and, and agencies around the development of coronavirus vaccines, which were established for MERS. Um, and this was something that was established in the R&D blueprint several years ago. And there was some investment in that, which we could leverage to start here. But we need more vaccines worldwide um, that are safe and effective because more vaccines means more production and it means more availability in countries around the world so that we can get them to people quicker. So we are working with a number of, of companies, a number of um, researchers that are developing those to make sure um, that we can increase supply and demand. And among the vaccines that are available, um, make sure that we get vaccines to those who need it most. Um, through COVAX and through um, all of our partners with the ACT Accelerator, our goal is to make sure that the people who are most vulnerable and most at risk receive this vaccine first um, because they are the ones that are on the front line. They are the ones that are at most risk for, for severe disease. And so that we are working through with partnerships and we're, and we're really thrilled uh, for the U.S. to join COVAX. Great. Well, I could ask you many more questions, but let me turn to Lois now and bring her into the conversation. And her perspective is very important, both having worked on the ground uh, in countries to help support um, health needs and advocate for health um, needs and now in her critical leadership role. So Lois, over to you. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm interested in getting into a discussion as well, but I wanted to make a few points um, in response to both uh, Rochelle and Maria now. Uh, you know, I'm, I have to say I'm heartened by being a part of this panel um, and not just because of what it represents um, sort of wholly around cooperation, but specifically um, because we're bringing WHO and CDC together in a way that I think we were all um, really uh, wanting to continue. And uh, we as advocates uh, were fully in support of the US re-engaging uh, with WHO. And so it's uh, glad for us to hear that that's welcome. It's obviously good news um, for us to see that uh, continue because there's just too much work to be done to, to be going it alone, frankly. Um, when I think about that partnership though, it's not just technical. It's 
financial, it's operational, and it's, you know, it's obviously political. Uh, and so I, I guess I want to bring that to the fore as well. Uh, Peggy, you mentioned investments in COVAX, for example, and we, our U.S. Congress uh, ended up including some funding in their most recent uh, emergency funding package for um, vaccines specifically, and I think that was really encouraging. There's still a lot more uh, in terms of need with regards to resources, and so advocates uh, and others, frankly, are, are really pushing for additional resources for, as you said, Peggy, not just COVAX, but the ACT accelerator and other components of the global response uh, to COVID. We still need more treatments. We still need more supplies. We still need these other partners like CEPI and Global Fund and the like um, to also be capable of responding as we know they can. And so it's sort of building on these U.S. investments is going to be critically important and, and again all the more reason why we want to be working shoulder to shoulder um, with our international partners. There's a there's an operational piece too that's sort of been covered with the logistics of, of, around getting a vaccine around the globe right um, but I don't know if we often talk about just data uh, and, and what's required just to understand where all countries are with their with their um, with their outbreaks or with their with their response to this crisis um, and also other, you know, around genomic surveillance, for example, but there are other exchanges that we often see between a CDC and WHO that are critically important now, particularly in light of how things continue to shift and change over time. And so I think that's just another example of, of why I'm encouraged by people coming back um, to the table. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this idea of how we communicate what it is we're doing, it's more than the science, it's more than the tactics. It's, it's gotta come down to the narrative and what people understand with regards to the value of this relationship um, because we've lost uh, some of that in the past year. And Maria has said, sure, people were still very much connected and in touch. And I think that, that that's, that's very true, um, but there is still some, some missing points, right? And, and the thing is we know whether, you know, working with CDC, working at WHO, um, something like vaccine hesitancy is something that experts there have faced over decades. Uh, it's come into play with polio, it's come into play with measles. Um, how do they now join forces to address some of these same issues with COVID-19 and, and our vaccination efforts uh, today? So that's one example of how sort of this partnership can come into play with regards to communication. Um, but I think there, there are plenty more as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that evolves over the next year, particularly as variants make that communication more challenging, um, unfortunately. I also would be remiss if I didn't come back to the critical importance of global vaccine equity. And I, we've all seen the reports, we've all uh, you know, come to understand that no one is safe until we all are safe. Um, but I still, we are in a position where 50 or some odd doses have been distributed to um, the African continent, right? That's not okay. And I know that everyone in all countries and leaders of those countries are feeling a, a, a special kind of pressure to take care of their own, so to speak. Um, and yet we will continue to see these variants emerge and evolve um, as long as people are left unvaccinated, as long as people are at risk um, for contracting this virus. And so there is clearly a moral imperative here, and that's what motivates me largely, but there's also a very real economic imperative, right? And you have um, data dropping as recently as last week, really speaking to the trillions of dollars uh, lost by us not really working in solidarity uh, with others. And there's just a, a very practical imperative too. Again, um, this virus will continue to outsmart us um, if, we, if we resist working uh, in solidarity. And so I think the calls for vaccinating health workers worldwide at the very least, um, and otherwise really working to invest in facilities like COVAX um, are just going to continue to be important uh, moving forward uh, in terms of a government response. Um, I, I think beyond that, I just wanna, I wanna drive home Maria's point that we need more <laughs> and better of everything. And it, it's not just about vaccines in this regard. Treatments are very much outsmarting these variants to, or sorry, excuse me, variants are very much outsmarting treatments that we have available. And so we need more R&D for, for those innovations as well as just supply chain and PPE. So coming back to the public health measures we all know and love and the, the, the tried and true guidance that we've heard over the past year still stands. 
Um, but we need to ensure that we're getting masks and other PPE to people on the front lines and others at risk. Um, and we, we each need to be doing our part to ensure that's happening. But, but it's, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of hope that's come into play with regards to the vaccine. We know that it's not a silver bullet and especially given not everyone's going to have access to that at the same time. And so I want to be sure that as we talk about these variants, as we talk about uh, essential innovation around these variants, that um, it's, it's holistic, it's inclusive of the range of technologies and innovations that are required. And our partners at Global Health Technologies Coalition talk about this a lot. Um, and, and I think we need to heed their, their call to action that um, we truly look across uh, what collaborations like ACT Accelerator are calling for in terms of the need uh, and address that um, holistically. We want as many tools in our toolbox as possible when it comes to continuing to fight this uh, over the next several months and perhaps even beyond. Um, the final thing I'll say as well is that it's not just this global opportunity or an opportunity for global partnership. As, as much as I love to see Geneva talking to Washington or Atlanta, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize how embedded CDC has been with WHO country offices, for example, and, and that relationship on the ground. And as you said, Peggy, I am a person who has um, lived and worked on the ground in these countries. And, and frankly, I wanna shine a light on all of the people in countries around the world who have been doing such terrific, painstaking work um, over the past year. They've done it with their hands tied behind their back in many cases, and yet they, they persist, right? And so I, I wanna shine a light on that work because you have initiatives like the Global Health Security Agenda. Um, you also have uh, the Africa CDC, obviously that's emerged as a beacon really, I think with, with regards to the response, but we have these regional, um, if not country or local partnerships and, and initiatives that require just as much support, right? And, and, and could benefit from us reactivating um, the exchange that has worked so well when it's come to tackling public health crises over time. So um, with that, I want to turn it back to you, but thank you again for allowing me to, to give my take on, on how um, COVID-19 is continuing to challenge us, um, but in ways we are also continuing to fight back. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, there certainly is no panacea, no magic bullet, but there are important strategies that we know uh, we have to pursue. We have, you know, the great luxury of having a very uh, rich and expert panel and sadly not enough time, but I do want to give um, both uh, Oliver uh, Morgan from WHO and uh, John Brooks from CDC a, a chance to quickly weigh in as they are day in, day out working on these challenges. Oliver, maybe you first. Great, thanks Peggy, and, and thanks very much for the other panelists. I think most of it has been covered, but actually um, I wanted to shine uh, a little bit of light actually on the fact that a lot of these uh, situations with emerging variants have actually been detected by astute epidemiologists who've been watching the trends of disease uh, and cases uh, in their countries and uh, around the world and, uh, and seen something different and that initiated the investigation into uh, in many cases the different types of variants and there have been many other variants that have been looked into as well uh, as part of routine epidemiologic investigations. I think it's also really important to recognize that what we've learned so far particularly we've got a very rich amount of information from the B117 uh, uh, transmission in the UK has really been done at enormous speed uh, by UK scientists and UK epidemiologists. And I think it's really, really important that we continue to encourage such great epidemiologic work around the world. Uh, we see also now in Southern Africa, uh, increasing epidemiological trends in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique as well. And what we don't quite have yet is the laboratory capacity to match with the good on the ground work that the local epidemiologists are doing. And Maria mentioned the importance of us having a connected uh, capacity around the world to support countries where that capacity doesn't exist uh, and to leverage again in a, uh, the most effect effective way possible uh, to uh, see what's happening in many different countries. 
So thanks very much and I'll pass over to John. Great, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And thanks again also for the opportunity to uh, be on this panel today. It's great to hear, uh, despite this fight going on for a year, how invigorated people are by the changes that are happening. And it's particularly nice, of course, at our agency that we have Dr. Walensky and we continue to have a very good relationship with WHO. It's hard for me to elaborate in great length on anything that anyone said. I, I guess the couple of things I'd like to add is when we're thinking about what you need to invest in to end this epidemic and to be sure that we are ready for the next one, because this isn't the last one. History shows us there will be another one. I think we need to make sure we all don't forget to invest in human capital. You know, we can do, we can spend a lot of money developing systems that sequence viruses, that transport the specimens, that, you know, manufacture the things. But as Oliver pointed out, it's the prepared mind that is often in the right place to quickly recognize there's a problem. One of the issues we're seeing with all of these sequences is we're, we're boosting thousands and thousands of sequences and they're being uploaded to databases that everyone in the world has access to. But the skill of the person, the number of people skilled to interpret those data meaningfully is, are right now few. I mean, they're good and they're working hard, but that's an investment we can't forget to leave behind. The other one are sort of what I like to call the um, silent uh, problems that we, you don't see. There's a lot of issues around logistics and supply chain that, you know, it's but for the grace of one factory that sometimes something is getting manufactured. You know, when you make a vial of vaccine, there are a whole bunch of pieces that go into it. And if all those aren't lined up, the company that's making the little rubber tops or prints the expiry date on the bottom of the thing, if that's not working, you're out of luck. So remembering that there's a lot of very mundane sounding kinds of things that have to be continually funded to make this work. And I think that's part of what public health is, you know, it's both this excitement and commitment, but there's a very important, rather mundane part of keeping the car running and in good shape. And uh, I look forward to really using this epidemic as an opportunity to firm that up uh, around the world. The only other thing I want to add is that with regard to um, complacency. We're hearing a lot about complacency as things go on. This is a place where we need political leadership. It feels increasingly like the political leadership between the United States, the WHO, and around the world is beginning to align very clearly on the same needs, the same messages, and talking the same way about this epidemic. If we're not talking the same way, the message gets garbled, and people don't get a clear sense of what they need to do. The other is dealing with fatigue. And I wish I had an easy answer to it, but we do need to build resilience and take time for ourselves uh, from time to time so that we can keep our batteries charged moving forward. Well, thank you. And uh, all of you have provided such excellent points and information, um, issues for us to think about and work on. Before we close, and I want to give uh, Stephen Morrison a chance to, to make some observations, I do want to just raise one other point, and it's, it's a challenging one. I mean, I think I agree with what was just said, that we are aligning more um, than we perhaps have been in recent times as the U.S. and the global community around some of the critical steps that have to be taken and the importance of a coordinated, concerted effort working together and the recognition that you know, no one and no nation can be safe until everyone around mm -hmm. the world is. On the other hand, you know, we live in a world where we have experienced increased nationalism. We know that mm -hmm. the fear of what may be happening in, in, in one country coming to another. Maria mentioned about the importance of the, the the terminology, the lexicon for these emerging variants and, and the importance of not labeling them UK, South Africa, um, uh, Brazil, because while they may have been recognized there and they may be having profound impact in those specific countries, it isn't as though these variants are a product of those nations. They were the ones that recognized them. And we have to create a world in which there can be an openness of information, good information and bad information without countries shutting down, pointing fingers and without countries being reluctant to share information for fear that there may be 
um, economic or other consequences that are negative of their actions. So I, I did want to just put that on the table. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, I think, to really adequately address it. But I might turn um, uh, first to Maria and then to Stephen, who has been working on these issues for such a long time, to, to offer some thoughts. And then maybe Stephen can also, um, I think we're going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. But Maria, you, you're in sort of a hot spot there for the, the yeah. concerns. Well, I mean, as you said, we could probably speak for another three days on that particular topic, but it's absolutely critical. Um, it's easy to say that we need information to be shared, epidemiologic, clinical, genomic sequencing, but we need there to be a system in place to do so. And we need countries and people to feel comfortable to be able to do that without retribution, without punishment. Um, and this is really important because what we are seeing right now, and, and, and COVID is the latest example of this, but we can give an example of any emerging pathogen, any humanitarian event um, over and over and over again. Countries need to be able to share that so that people can act, so that we know what we're looking at, we know what we're dealing with. And it needs to be done rapidly. Um, we have the international health regulations, which is this global legal framework that we have to be able to do so. And we are following alerts and, and, and Oliver could probably talk about this for the next few hours as well. You know, we're following all of these alerts and they have to be investigated, but countries need the ability to share this information. This virus evolution working group that we've established is a group of a small group of scientists around the world. South Africa contacted us to say, we have something we want to share that was shared amongst this group that alerted individuals in the UK, um, you know, to look even further. But as Oliver said, there's epidemiologic, uh, astute epidemiologists and clinicians in place. It's, it's a patchwork um, that's an incredibly intricate puzzle piece um, that needs the ability uh, to share information because information is power. Information allows us to design and develop public health actions um, that can prevent small events becoming something bigger. Um, it could help us for the next one because there certainly will be one. Um, but it is really, really critical that last point that you make, Peggy. Well, I think maybe Stephen, we're gonna need to have another panel on that topic. Um, but I, you know, I, I will admit that I have failed as the moderator because we're already over time, but I do want to turn now. I want to thank all of the panelists for their, their extraordinary contributions to this panel, but, but even more importantly, what they are doing every day, uh, working hard um, to uh, really address uh, the challenges of this unprecedented COVID pandemic. But Stephen, I want to turn to you for some thoughts and concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to second the thank yous to everyone who's participated, very rich. There's a lot of statements that are gonna, I think be embedded in our minds going forward. Things like, we are with you on this, or this virus is not sick of us. <laughs> and we all need, we need more prepared minds. I mean, these are all very powerful statements. This is a really dark moment. And you know, I, how we preserve our confidence and our energy and our optimism is so important. I mean, the. I had a conversation with someone earlier today who was describing this moment as this is the end of the beginning. Um, this, that was a Churchillian statement made in a dark moment in the war. Um, and perhaps that sort of captures a bit of where we are right now. I was very impressed with the energy and the enthusiasm. I continue to believe that WHO is such an asset, but a poorly understood asset here in the United States. And I think having Oliver and Maria with us today. A very great thanks to Gabrielle uh, Stern for helping put this all together. It's very important we need to do more of this. I also think that va it's vaccine hesitancy doesn't begin to capture here in the United States what we're really at risk of. Our trust and confidence has been deeply damaged over the last four years. And we have, an we have the possibility as we saw at Dodgers Stadium yesterday for expressions of hesitation to become acts of, 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 of near violent uh, interventions and opposition in the, the spillover of many of the deep tensions, unresolved tensions within our society that can migrate right into this, into this space. And I fear we, will, we can see more of that if we're not very, very care, care, careful. We didn't talk much about that. The Biden administration has been very deliberate in its national strategy 
around confronting these problems. I want to offer special thanks to Clifton Jones and John Monson producing this. And again, to Amith Mandavili, Mark, our colleague who put all of the pieces together. Uh, the last point, the missing high level political leadership has been a striking conspicuous gap in the last year. And I hope we're beginning to get out of that with these changes that we are beginning to see. I know there's some plans possibly for a February 19th summit organized by the Munich Security Conference. Those details have not been finalized, but things like that are beginning to happen. And that's very, very important. Thank you all. Thank you.